Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Live Show. I'm your host, Bob Krell, publisher and founder of Healthy Indoors Magazine and uh, your tour guide for the next 60 minutes. Um, today's a great uh, great topic. We're, you know, we've been hearing a lot over the past year uh, of people's renewed or, you know, new interest in trying to make the indoor spaces healthier. And a lot, you know, a lot of the solutions have, that have been discussed or involve various, various forms or concepts around air filtration, ventilation, air purification. So with us today, uh, we have Vinny Labdell, who's the president of the Healthway family of brands. I've known Vinny for a long time. He's actually uh, located, uh, at least his home base is in our uh, central New York area too. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, he's uh, He's been involved in indoor environmental for a long time. And especially over the past 12 years, he's been dealing in that IAQ space. He's been traveling all over the globe, uh, you know, dealing, dealing with uh, a variety of topics on uh, the harmful effects of occupying built environments. So uh, Vinny took over the leadership role as the president of the Healthway uh, family of brands back in 2008. Uh, shortly after that, Healthway was named to the Inc. 500 list for fastest grow growing companies in America. And today, Healthway is recognized as the global leader in air purification solutions uh, and builds portable and engineered modular scalable options for residential and commercial spaces. Um, he, Healthway uh, also, uh, his company, he evolved... Uh, uh, a second uh, operation, and Vinny will elaborate on that, 2017, uh, to create a B2C uh, brand. And he is a co-founder of IntelliPure, which uh, has a heavy emphasis on customer experience through handcrafted, high efficiency, individually certified air cleaning systems. And over the past six months, Healthway and IntelliPure have been uh, called upon by the New York City uh, Health and Hospital, Atlantic Health Systems, uh, UA Ministry of Health, and hundreds of corporate clients around the globe. Um, so very exciting. Uh, really happy to have you here. So uh, please uh, welcome uh, Vinny. How are you? Thank you. I'm great, Bob. Thank you for the time and for the opportunity to speak with you. So um, with us also uh, in the uh, co-pilot seat today is our uh Editor of Healthy Indoors Magazine, Susan Valenti, coming uh, live from, uh, yeah, Andover, Massachusetts. How are you? And Susan, Susan's been fighting off a cold all week. So this is, uh, I, I'm using the term cold, uh, probably minimizing it. So for those those, those of you in our, our uh, live virtual studio audience, uh, uh, we're going to uh, have you keep your cameras off again for the first half of the show like we typically do. Uh, but we will invite you to uh, during this first half of the show, uh, engage in the chat. So you can open up your chat window and Susan will be there as moderator uh, fielding those sort of things. Uh, we'll be putting links up throughout the show. Um, and then uh, right around the halfway mark or a little past that, we'll invite you to turn your cameras on and you can use the raise hand function down in reactions to uh, get called on to ask questions. So I guess uh, without further ado, uh, let, let, let's get right into it. Um, so Vinny, you've been doing this for a while. Yeah, it's been a family affair. My father, uh, it's really all he's done and founded a company in 1981. Um, him and I joined forces in 98. So I've been at it for now more than two decades. And it's been um, a really exciting time, although, in a, you know, a troubling time for most, but it's an exciting time for the industry. You know, I think air quality, indoor air quality and air pollution in general has been one of the top health epidemics of our time. And I think if there's one silver lining during this pandemic is that now people are paying more attention to something that we really can't see. And so I think this is a great opportunity for the industry as a whole to really move itself forward. So, I mean, you're seeing it as a, you know, as an opportunity. And I think we've, we've said that over the last uh, several months too uh, on the show here, because while, you know, indoor air quality has always been there, it's always been part of the discussion. It hasn't really been at the forefront, right? I mean, it's, you know, only for us, we're jaded, right? The, those of us in the industry, obviously, is in the forefront of what we do every day, but to a general, you know, the general consumer, general public around the world, not so much. Um, and and this, this is a unique opportunity we have here. Um, so let, let's get, let's talk basics a little bit. You know, what are, what do you believe are some of the primary causes of uh, why we have indoor air quality problems? And in well, you know, I, I was actually just touching on this earlier. I mean, it goes back to, I think really when the industry started to see a lot of momentum and movement was in 2008, when all of our athletes were going to the Beijing Olympics, right? We could actually see the pollution in the air. People started to really wonder if air quality or air pollution had detrimental effects. And I think now, really the advent of monitoring, right? I mean, low cost monitoring hitting the market and kind of giving people the ideas they can see what's in the air. I think that's gonna be crucially important. And then COVID just really accelerated people's 
I, I think it went from a nice thing to have to an essential thing to have. Um, but of course, the ultra fine particles, these really, really small lung penetrating particles, we now know that they cause a tremendous amount of disease and irritation to humans. Um, and the biggest challenge we have is the way we've lived in our built environment for so long. We've we built really highly efficient spaces, right? And so building those highly efficient spaces generally could be counterproductive to ventilation and can be counterproductive to filtration, can be counterproductive to the occupant. And so, um, you know, really the, the biggest challenge you have with air pollution in general is, is that it's not equal, right? There's VOCs, there's bioaerosols, there's ultrafine particles and larger particulates. And all of those things don't necessarily, aren't necessarily solved. The problems aren't necessarily solved with the same solution. So it's really understanding the environment, understanding what space we're trying to handle and then devising a solution to meet that need. Well, I mean, it's also, it's more, more than just the, um, the indoor environment, right? The outdoor environment is going to come into play. You know, in, in the United States, we, a lot of times, uh, we, you know, we, advocate people, uh, you know, bringing in more fresh air, more outside air, right? And, and you mentioned Beijing. I, I, that's that's a that's a great example. Uh, in spaces, you know, in, Ch- in many places in China, in uh, India, a lot of these these uh, burgeoning industrialized areas, the, the outdoor air is rough. I mean, there's the PM two point five counts are just they're they're awful. So the thought, you know, the concept of you're going to bring in more outside air is yeah. that is, well, you know, I think- I think the concept of bringing in outside air, um, people confuse that fresh air. They say, bring in fresh air from outside. Um, Great, great analogy. I mean, generally, you could be exacerbating a bunch of other issues for people. During the pandemic, though, we know that the pollutant is the person, right? I mean, we now know that people are the uh, people, basically the occupant is the pollutant. So as we bring more people back, I I think we're deprioritizing pollen allergies and asthma and all the other symptoms uh, so we want to bring in the fresh air from the outside to reduce or potentially dampen the impact of cross-contamination from COVID. But you're exactly right. I mean, the whole ERV, HRV market, we're going to have to see a substantial movement towards higher efficiency filtration inside of those systems, simply because bringing in fresh air outside may reduce the implications of COVID, but it could be exacerbating a bunch of other issues at hand for people. So once we get a gra- uh, uh, our hands around this, this beast, I think we'll certainly see some greater improvements in that in that space as well. Yeah, I mean, ventilation alone obviously isn't going to, uh, you know, it's, it's not the option. I mean, in many in many locations right around mm-hmm. the globe, ventilation is not is really not a viable option. You know, the outside air is so uh, massively more contaminated than the indoor environment. So, you know, I guess, what do you see as some of the primary causes of uh, uh, degraded indoor air quality? You know, well, I, so you've I been you've been touring all over and seeing you know seeing yeah, the global I mean, perspective. Really, obviously, obviously, industrialization, the way we the way we're fueling our vehicles, a lot of leasing with diesel. There's a lot of that that's traditional, but really, people, the occupant. I think you'll see that there's that's that's a big part of the pollution. How we live in our space, how our buildings can breathe. So I think you'll see a big movement towards more, not just energy efficiency from the bottom line, but how our buildings are breathing, how they're being filtered. I don't think you'll see a building in the future um, that's not built now with high efficiency filtration and the proper ventilation, right? Um, But pollution, I think, comes from everywhere, right? Um, The chemicals we're spraying in our space. Now there's this huge discussion around all the surface cleaning we've done. Has it been more counterproductive than productive, right? Um, A lot of times we jump to do things like that because we can see it and we can smell it. So if you can see it and smell it, um, it's great. You go into bathrooms and you'll smell that Clorox or that bleach and be like, wow, it's clean in here. And uh, you'll walk out and have an asthma attack. So, I mean, I really think we have to look at how we're cleaning and treating our spaces, being a little bit more responsible there. Uh, But again, I think that the benefit of all that's happened is it's really opened up people's eyes to the detrimental implications of poor air quality. And I think as an industry, if we can start looking at ways to improve that, um, I think we'll all be in a much better shape. You know, you raise an interesting point there too. you know, as far as, far as the, the, the clean smell or the perception of, you know, what's what's clean. Um, we Delphine Farmer was on, uh, she's a researcher uh, out in Colorado, um, talking about that back in, uh, it was November, right before Thanksgiving. Uh, they did a whole home chem study and, you know, this whole perception of what we believe is clean, you know, that we believe there should be an odor associated with clean and is you know, it, uh, not so much. Uh, no. There should actually be no odor associated with clean. It should be the absence of odor. Correct. Correct. Yeah. You know, but you know that's the thing. There's been a lot of solutions that have been touted in, in res, you know, in response to this pandemic, right? You know, and obviously 
enhanced cleaning, you know, fogging, spraying, all, all these chemicals, right? And I think a lot of that was, it was a knee jerk reaction because we got to do something. Well, we can do this. You know, this is something we can start wiping everything down and spraying everything. But in, in fact, right, we're dealing with a, a with COVID, at least we're dealing with an, an aerosol transmission. So obviously yeah. now it's, and now it's back to air cleaning, ventilation. These, these are really the, the topics we need to be talking about, but overall you see that going forward. That's the thing. The, the one point you just mentioned in, in your, in your last segment was um, uh, the fact that offices or, you know, just in general commercial spaces are going to change a little. And, oh, and there's, I, been a, there's been a complete fundamental shift in the way we think about healthier spaces. Um, this has had such a detrimental effect globally to corporations' bottom lines, to people's health. I mean, just the, um, the amount of people that have been impacted by this. Um, we certainly will not go backwards. What we're seeing, uh, and I think the industry is seeing, is again, a fundamental shift where people are looking at, there was this big phase one rush about getting people back to work and about you know making sure the space was safe for essential employees. And that generally came down to installing portable air cleaners, you know, boosting up an air exchange rate if the, um, and filtering out any likelihood of cross-contamination. But I think what you'll see moving forward is a complete, um, a complete upgrade of infrastructure uh, in, in existing buildings so that we can address the issue. I mean, what's lurking in our air matters, right? And ultimately every building with a door needs enhanced filtration. Um, not just filtration, there's a lot of things they need. And I think we're going to certainly start paying more attention. To that. That's at least what we're seeing as a company. I mean, what do you see, you know, as, as far as, you know, dealing with indoor environmental issues, what, what are some of the first steps that, you know, if, if somebody perceives that, you know, their office space or their home, you know, is, is having an IQ issue, what, how do they approach that? What do, what do you, how do you see you know, that? I, it, the air quality problems, again, like we were just talking about, come in all shapes and sizes. And really, I think, Air, air cleaning as a gen, in general will become a service. I think that you're going to see that people, you, you can't see it in a lot of cases. I mean, if you have mold growing on your wall or if you have a high humidity, most people relate good air quality to temperature and humidity. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too moist, it's not moist enough. I think really what people should do if they're concerned or they think they have a major IAQ problem is they should consult an expert, someone in the space that really understands air quality that can come out and give them real data. Everything comes down to data. Come in, do an air quality test. You know, the problem is, is that that's expensive sometimes. So you've got the top tier corporate clients that are willing to do it because they have the resources. Um, but then you have kind of the second tier and third tier that it's a challenge for them, especially when business is tough. How do they, how do they afford the ability to, and I think that's going to come back down to standards and regulations, right? I think the industry is going to start regulating what can be put in spaces. They're going to start looking at minimum thresholds and they've already done that. Ashtray done a great job with certain things. So, but I think ultimately, if you're really concerned, I would certainly consult an IAQ expert. Um, Bob, you can share several different platforms where you can find one, where you can come out and actually get real data. And before you make a substantial investment, right, um, you should see if that product works. And a lot of times pre and post testing is the most important thing you can do. So, so that, that raises the issue specifically, we're talking about air cleaning, uh, air cleaning stuff. How, what, what is going to make, or how do you define what's effective as an air cleaning technology or solution for a space? How, a great question. It really depends on the size space and it depends on what you're trying to remove, right? I mean, ultimately an air cleaning impact study is really, really simple to do. I mean, particles floating in the space, you monitor the air quality beforehand, you come in, a lot of companies now are going in and basically to get a, a, an idea of people coming back, they push particles into the space and get a baseline reading, then they push particles out and get a higher reading, and they bring air cleaning in, additional air changes based on the HVAC system, and get an idea of whether or not that machine is going to be effective as they bring people back. So there's a lot of things you can do. Um, a lot of companies are concerned with VOCs. One of the things that I think is the least most focused on in the marketplace is volatile organic compounds. Crucial. A lot of portable air cleaners don't do a very good job with VOCs simply because in most cases you need a high level of granular absorption. That's counterproductive to the traditional air cleaning process because you, as you stack more media, you reduce the airflow. Um, so that's a challenge, right? And I think that's where fresh, clean outside air can really help dilution. Um, but it, that's the, really understanding it from an expert analysis, having them come in and first verifying what's in your space. Without that data, um, it's really hard to design a system that's going to meet that need. That's the, that's a great point you're making too. You know, a lot of a lot of technology, uh, and we've always been big, you know, proponents of uh, HEPA filtration and HEPA, you know, portable yeah. cleaners. 
but that's not addressing any gaseous contaminants, right? <laughs> no VOCs are being addressed by HEPA filter. Um, yeah, so that's that's exactly right. And and so, you know, I think what it comes down to is, is you, you look at all types of mechanical filtration. We still believe that mechanical filtration, certainly during this time, is the most effective measure of remediating the, the COVID-19 pandemic. High efficiency systems, whether you're going from HEPA, ALPA, I mean, really HEPA is an acronym, right? Um, high efficiency, particularly the rest, or we want a system that has total system efficiency. One of the things that I think the industry misses all the time is bypass and real solutions that have total system efficiency. And now that there's this much light around air quality, I think you're going to look at companies really designing products the right way. I can't tell you the amount of systems we test that say they're HEPA certified or have HEPA air cleaning efficiency. And when you get them and you test them, they're 60% or 70% efficient. They're using a HEPA type filter media, but the way the system's engineered, the way it's designed is nowhere near giving you true system efficiency of HEPA or ALPA efficiency. And I think that's really crucial. I mean, sometimes you pay for what you get. Um, but to, to, to um, answer your question directly, you're exactly right. No matter what system you have, and when you're looking at VOC removal, there's certain things you can do, but dilution is certainly probably the best method. Um, adding granular absorption, understanding what type of VOCs are in the space, right? Because some granular absorbing media has a better reaction or better absorption rate than others based on what's in the environment. So whether it's a benzene, whether it's a toluene, whether it's a formaldehyde, understanding what's in the space is still going to give you the best chance of solving the problem. I mean, that comes back to there's really not a one size fits all solution. We were talking about that in pre-show. Um, there's there's just not one answer. You can, there's not. And I think that's that's one of one of my concerns in the industry is there's people touting silver bullet solutions, you know, that there's going to be like we can we've got the magic solution to fix everything in your space. It's like, eh. yeah, Do you believe yeah, that exists. No, that certainly doesn't exist. And that, I think that goes back to, you know, our premise is we believe in all technologies. Really, they're from a, we build all technologies. It's really the utilization of technology that's most important. And that utilization generally comes through someone that understands the need. Um, so a lot of people are buying products from manufacturers, not really understanding what they're trying to solve. Um, and, and I think that's going to be crucially important. Um, understanding the need, understanding the space, understanding the variables that come into the space. And I think that's going to come back down again, Bob, to how we're building spaces, right? There's a lot of organizations out there that are working really hard on finding the best ways to build healthier spaces. And based on that, once we get that solid foundation, then we'll be able to better understand the dynamic we're faced with. And let's face it, we have a, a large amount of building stock, right, in, in this country and really throughout the planet that really was never des designed with this in mind, right? You know, we, we're, uh, it's a new world now, right? So we, we have a lot of retrofit that has to happen or a lot of redesign, reimagining, uh, reutilization yeah. of spaces. I, I think you're going to see a lot of, at least in the white collar space, going to be a lot of people working remotely. You know, we've done yeah, it for I, a year. I think you're right. I think that you're going to see that. But I, I, I can tell you firsthand some of the largest property management firms in the world, they're spending substantial resources on making sure they can fill those buildings again. And, uh, you know, that this is a, a massive industry that relies on high occupancy um, and customers. I, I, I just I spoke to a major corporate client. They said, well, we just, we don't understand how to, what technology is right. And I said, you gotta, you gotta have your property test. You gotta, we gotta understand the implications of your space and what, how you're heating and cooling the space. Like we talk about all the time, Bob. And I, I'll tell you that right now that people are gonna demand healthier spaces. Um, and as monitoring comes and provides lower cost point monitoring, so people can actually see what's in their air they're breathing, they're going to demand good air quality. And again, that, that could mean multitudes of technology, right? It's not a one size fits all. So it's really about understanding that. I do think you're going to see a resurgence to the, to the um, workplace. I do think it's going to take some time. And I do think customers are going to start, or, or um, tenants and landlords and management companies are going to start focusing on air quality as the key driver to getting people back. I, mean, I see on, a, on your company websites, uh, you know, references to, you know, have, having an, in your bio too, a fully modular, scalable solutions. You know, what does that actually, you know, what do you mean by that? And why is that something that, you know, is important? Well, what's important? What's important for us is, you know, whether it's a small portable room that's three to 400 square feet, that solution may be different than the solution that's a million square foot building in, in New York City or Dubai. And so essentially what we've done is we've modularized, um, ducted systems with a certain pressure drop and efficiency where we can basically put it together like a Lego system, front load or side load. It ties directly into the air handler without a capex and it gives you the ability to filter air at the point of entry. That may not be suitable in some cases. So then you have larger from small to large size portable units 
or self-contained units. So self-contained units can be hung. And that goes back to really, you know, if you're really looking at being a true solution to the problem, you have to have multiple ranges of solutions because first there's three things you have to take in consideration. What size space are you cleaning and what's the noise level that you're gonna clean it at? Um, there's this huge movement around, well, we need them in doctor's offices and schools and daycare centers. But if, you know, they have a certain CFM requirement and you got to turn the machine on high, it can be counterproductive or counterintuitive to the learning environment or to the medical mm -hmm. environment. So it's really about building a range of solutions that fit different applications. And that's, you know, like we've talked about, we've been building commercial air cleaning for 25, 30 plus years, and no one cared about it. I mean, for the cigarette smoke movement, everyone cared about electrostatic precipitation. It was a great technology for that application. But after smoking was banned in most cases, the only place commercial air cleaners existed was in the medical space. And so um, now, just now, people are really starting to focus on commercial air cleaning. So, you know, as far as commercial air cleaning goes, there, there's a lot of different flavors of that too, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, I've, we, we've, been, we've been hearing about just various technologies, right, for decades and different things out there. And, you know, there's uh, all kinds of debates and people sniping at each other. But, but give us a little quick overview, if you could, just on, on some of the common technologies out there. And I know you have you have some patented stuff that you guys do with Healthway. And just bring yeah, that so up I, too. I'd I like mean, to hear what you do. Really, again, you have you have really some of uh, the platform of media filtration, mechanical filtration, which ranges anywhere from a low efficiency MERV filter all the way to a high efficiency HEPA, ALPA. Our technology is a combination of mechanical and electrostatic where we're enhancing that filter media, electrically enhancing that filter um, and containing everything inside that media. Um, but, you know, there's the mechanical side of things, which is tested time run. You can show it, you can prove it in real life applications. And I think that's really what's gotten the most, um, certainly the most recommendations during this time because it's been out there the longest people understand it. You can put a filter in front of an airstream and see what's taken out before and after. Um, you know, UV, UV is an excellent and very effective technology, but again, it's the application and utilization of UV. Um, UV stuck in the middle of an airstream where you're not monitoring the airflow velocity by the bulb, you're not monitoring the intensity of the bulb, you're not measuring the shielding of particles, not very effective. So it goes back to how are we utilizing these technologies? You have a manufacturer spec and then you have actually how it's installed. And those two things don't equate, equate success. Yeah. Um, a lot of other comments around, you know, people talk about ozone. Ozone is, is, is not meant to be an air cleaner, right? Air, ozone is meant to do one thing, disinfect and deodorize in unoccupied spaces. It should not be utilized as an air cleaning uh, product. Um, we've talked about photocatalytic oxidation or bipolar ionization. Um, very, very hot technology that people are talking about. Um, we understand it very well. I, I still think we're pretty short on the the, the data that's substantiated in the marketplace. So I think there, there probably could be some useful cases for bipolar. I just don't think they have enough data in the market where the experts in the industry, the so-called experts in the industry feel comfortable recommending it. Um, when there's other more time-tested technologies, I mean, we're dealing with the, you know, the probably the greatest pandemic of certainly in my time. The, sure. the only Ho hopefully, the hopefully it'll remain yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there's a lot of emerging technologies, but ultimately what it comes down to is, and I, 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 we talk about this all the time, you know, are we removing the pollutant from the space and are we permanently removing the pollutant from the space? That's gonna give us the best likelihood of remediating the problem. If we're not doing that, or we don't know if we're doing that, that's gonna create some level of um, uncertainty. And certainly in this time, the goal should be how are we removing the pollutant and how are we permanently removing the pollutant so that there's no chance of reintroduction. Yeah, I mean, versus potentially just modifying the pollutant into some other chemical constituent or plating it out on the surface. <laughs> yeah, or or you know, scattering stuff, um, yeah, scattering right. it and not being sure where it's being collected. Uh, you know, I, that's I think that's really what's in the marketplace the the unknown, and I think that's what's concerning to people. Um, but again, you know, we we truly believe in all technology. It's uh, the utilization of technology that's the most important. So you guys have been at this for a while and obviously you have some proprietary stuff and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to force you to give us an infomercial here, but, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the things you've been doing because your company is, has been approaching uh, this, these solutions for a long time and somewhat differently, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we build, again, we build HEPA systems, we build ALPA systems, we build mechanical filtration systems. We, we build a lot of things. Our EEF technology, it's originally called EEF, electrically enhanced filter was designed, um, 
with the US government and was utilized in clean rooms for years. And essentially what that's doing is, is within a specific control zone, we're using a, a mechanical filter, a high efficiency mechanical filter, we're enhancing that media, we're controlling everything inside that so you don't have ion reduction or ion production outside of that. Um, you know, very, very, uh, very, very focused on making sure we pass all the carb standards and zero ozone standards. So we're not creating any negative byproduct, but really focusing on how we can deliver the highest amount of clean air with the lowest pressure drop. Um, essentially, what that gives you the ability to do is put a machine in a space where it may not require a capex. Uh, most of our modularized systems are not requiring a capex. They can be installed directly onto an HVAC system without a blower. And uh, whether it's a, a 1700 CM, CFM module or 2000, 3000, we modularize them, put them in using a synthetic media, continuously charging that media. And we're also creating a form of microbiostasis where Instead of using a wavelength of light, we're using a wavelength of, of electricity. We're permeating every fiber of that media, making it uh, more difficult for mold, virus, bacteria, and fungi to thrive in that environment. So, and that, that's a, I think that's a, that's an important point too. Is that what you're overcoming is one of the big challenges, right? High efficiency filtration, like HEPA, ALPA filtration. You know, you start getting MERV 16 and higher. You, you've got a static pressure drop issue, and most mechanical equipment that's in place can't handle. Uh, you know, a HEPA filter can't get stuck in every air handler. You know, I think there's a misconception. Yeah, yeah. We just upgrade to a better filter. It's like there's there's a diminishing return there, and there's a point where you're choking off your airflow, and you can't do that. So, so this seems like you're you've got technology that allows you to uh, to be able to achieve higher efficiency with lower pressure drop. Right? Is that that's the whole premise? That right? our, that's, that's the whole premise of what we've what we've delivered on and what we've been focused on over the past years. Again, looking at all technologies and bringing technologies together to give us the best outcome. Um, and what's happening right now is if you look at filtration efficiencies, HEPA filters are great. There's just some applications where they don't work, right? We build HEPA, right? We have a lot of our systems have HEPA if they're needed HEPA on certain applications where you have to guarantee no bypass of ultrafine particles where you're in a situation where maybe it's a clean room environment. We can, we can put EEF or DFS on top of it. Um, but basically what's happened in most built environments is they really can only accept up to a MERV 11. And a MERV 11, if you look at the ash rate filtration chart, you're only at 30 to 50% efficiency. Um, and you know we're shifting from the, the, the focusing on protecting equipment. That's where the industry had focused for so long. Good point. Focusing on protecting the health and well-being of the occupant. And that's the paradigm shift. The paradigm shift now has moved where we're not just going to protect that $25,000 HVAC system we bought. We need to protect Mr. and Mrs. Jones, who's concerned with capturing COVID or the flu or whatever else. And that's to shift to high efficiency filtration. The benefit with what we've been able to accomplish is we've been able to accomplish greater than MERV 16 filtration efficiency with the pressure drop of a MERV 8 without losing efficiency like a traditional synthetic media. So your traditional synthetic media may have a great efficiency to start. You may, you, they may be able to promote a MERV 15, but as that filter loads, it drops to a MERV 8 or drops to a MERV 7. It could be two months. This filter never loses its efficiency over the life of the filter. Yeah, that, that's pretty profound. Um, and again, you, you do solutions that are, that are uh, both integrated solutions to existing equipment and standalone you know, because you're, you're covering you're covering a, a, a large range of product lines here because you're you're going from big mechanical installations to standalone portable, almost personal size devices. Correct, with your various technologies. Yeah, I mean, for example, for example, we have a portable unit that can be plug and played and handle a 300 to 400 square foot space, and we just designed a total installed solution for the Lincoln Center, America's largest entertainment venue. Um, and that's hundreds of modules that give you greater than MERS 16 filtration efficiency and show a reduction in energy cost. So that kind of gives you a scale of from small to large spaces, what we can do. But again, without the boots on the ground, without experts and IAQ professionals out there looking at the space, it's really hard to, I mean, everyone can, you can buy a portable system and it's a very commoditized market. You can, and there's a lot of good portables out there uh, because you know, they've got a, a really good fan. They're pushing a lot of air through the system. So you can get some really good portables. I just emphasize to people that you really want a system that has good total system efficiency. Don't just read a box. Look at what the total system efficiency is because a lot of people are paying a lot of money for a HEPA or what they say is an ALPA, but the total system efficiency is much, much, much smaller. Clar um, clarify that, it, you know, the, the, the difference. Well, total system efficiency, a HEPA, an ALPA filter, very, very efficient for um, ultra low penetra you know, particle arrestance, high efficiency particle arrestor, ALPA is more efficient. So basically a lot of systems out there have HEPA or ALPA filters. 
you and I, Bob, could go out and build a system and say it's HEPA tomorrow. We could take a hepatite media, put it in a box. The challenge you have is if that filter's not 100% sealed, if we've got bypass around the filter, the total system efficiency is not coming close to HEPA efficiency from the exhaust. If I take a class one laser particle counter, I put it on the intake, I measure a million particles coming in, I put it on the exhaust. What we're finding with a lot of HEPA filters is they're like 40 to 50% efficient. We don't name names, but a lot of very popular branded systems out there are nowhere near HEPA. Then there are a lot of really good high quality systems out there that are measuring intake, measuring the exhaust and showing greater than 99% of 99.97. That's a true sealed HEPA efficient filter. And what we always tell people, especially during this time, the details matter. Look and make sure that you're buying a system that is removing the smallest ultra fine particles and is doing it from a total system efficiency perspective. It's funny. I raised I raised that very uh, issue in my training classes. I do a lot of training, uh, you know, in, uh, in in the remediation space. And uh, you know, I always ask the question, you know, do you spe- you know, if you're a consultant or a contractor, do you use HEPA equi- HEPA filtered equipment? And they're always, yeah. And I go, how 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 do you know it's HEPA? Well, we bought a HEPA machine. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh well, well the the, the filter is a HEPA filter. I go, great, but have yeah. you ever certified the cabinet that you're running it through? You know. 100%. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's just not common practice anywhere in the asbestos abatement industries, in the United States, uh, mold remediation, they just, they just don't do it. I know in Canada and the province of Ontario, the asbestos industry uh, is required to actually do uh, DOP tests with a photometer on all their yeah. equipment, but that's yeah, an and anomaly. There's a, of, there's a, and a lot of companies now are moving more towards, moving more towards um, individually certifying machines. We've been doing it for a long time. Other great HEPA manufacturers have been doing it for a long time where every machine is individually spot checked and guaranteed to provide a certain level of efficiency. Imagine that's because that. This business. That's because the other companies that do it, that was their business. That was their livelihood. They had to find a way to be better. And what you see now is certainly because of the opportunity, right? You've got companies throwing a HEPA filter in a box and saying they're HEPA efficient or they're ALPA efficient or they achieve greater than this efficiency. And in reality, um, I think the industry will speak for itself eventually. I think what you're going to see is that again, the cost of low, the, 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 the low cost monitoring coming into play, people are actually going to be, be able to see what, what's in the air they breathe and not only be able to see what's in the air they breathe, but to correlate that to the implications of what's in the air they breathe. How is what's in the air affect health? And once we create and narrow that gap, you're going to start to see regulations really, really creep forward and say, hey, you should be installing this or you, you know, I think you're going to, it's just going to happen now. The, the total efficiency is a big issue though. I mean, especially, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of industry because I, I, I'm one of those people that have had laser particle counters for the past 30 years. So, you know, I, I actually do look at that and it, obviously you're not certifying with a laser counter, but you can certainly do a spot check. And uh, if you're not somewhere around 99% collection, you know, at that 0.3 micron, uh, you're not HEPA. <laughs> I don't care. What yeah, you, um, you're I, just I, not. <laughs> we have, we have um, one of the things, you know, I, I've been fortunate levels. You know, my father comes from a 35 plus year background in the air quality space. It's been his whole life's work. And here we have very sophisticated tools. We have condensation nuclei counters that actually can measure filtration efficiency down to the smallest size particle, a 0.2 nanometer. Um, a lot of people talk about Brownian motion and how 0.3 is the hardest particle to capture. And that's where you get into EN1822 testing and all that. But if you look at particle concentration, like a particle concentration counter, we can take any filter and what you find is manufacturers' claims and the actual filtration efficiency is drastically different. And that's why it's important as the industry starts to look at this to really focus on people that have been in the industry a long time. We're not the only one. There's a lot of companies that have been out in the industry a long time. I just challenge people to think about people that have been in the industry and really understand the business and aren't just looking at this as an opportunity to make a lot of money, but are looking at this as an opportunity to make a difference in a, in a category that really needs more light on it, right? I mean, we're dealing with the number one health epidemic of our time before COVID. This is, we're dealing with ultra fine particles are killing people. Uh, They're talking about Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, stroke. Hopefully the one thing we can get out of this is that people start taking this more seriously and start addressing the built environment in a much better way. Uh, You know, that, hopefully that is the ultimate uh, goal here. And and that, you know, uh, it's really important that, you know, we, we don't get through this pandemic, get to the other side of it and go back to doing things as usual, because as usual really wasn't good enough. So what I'm going to do now, we're at that, we're at that point. Um, I'd like 
those of you in our virtual studio audience uh, to turn your cameras on. And if you, we have three questions queued up already, we'll uh, be asking them. Our first off is going to be Terry Sofer is going to have one up. Um, and we'd ask that you would uh, raise your hand uh, to have your mic unmuted. But uh, at this point, you know, definitely bring your cams on. We'll see your lovely faces. And um, Terry, um, we'll have you unmute first. Um, let you get the first question in. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Vinny, impressed, impressed uh, with so much of what you said uh, about the needs in the, the industry and um, building indoor air quality needs. Uh, I had uh, one question. Uh, I made a quick trip to your website uh, and I couldn't find uh, that any technical information was available about the type of technologies used in your different units. Uh, I deal primarily with indoor air quality uh, for residential situations. And <clears throat> so uh, is that kind of information available on oh, your sure. website? Yeah, what we'll do is, as I have my, uh, Kaylin McCaffrey's here, she'll share all that information. That you maybe just, if you wanna go to intellipure.com, that's our B2C brand. There's much more market-facing information. So you should probably be able to dig that up. The healthway.com is more of a dealer resource. Um, and we appreciate that feedback. Literally next month, we're launching a global resource that's all content driven. Healthway will become this big content driven site and all the great things that are happening in the air quality industry. But we'd be happy to share not only the technology, but all the, the peer reviewed white papers, not peer reviewed test tube white papers, peer reviewed real application papers, <laughs> and whether it's whether it's United Airlines, whether it's some of the big partners we work with, where we talk about real air cleaning impact studies. And what we do there is we, we, we have a, a completely independent third-party clean room company based on these uh, organizations that come in and they inoculate the space with high levels of particles. They put different machines in and actually show the air cleaning effectiveness. It's different, different than efficiency, but the actual air cleaning effectiveness of the space and how bringing people back um, create an implication there. We'd be happy to share all that, all the technical data, um, all the technology information, anything that you need, we'd be happy to share it. A uh, quick question with regard to the residential. I see that you have a, a unit you referred to as a whole house um, unit. Uh, is yep. that a bypass unit or does that uh, take the entire return airflow? Takes the entire return airflow. Well, that's, that's amazing. I'd like to dig into that more. It gives you greater than MERV 16 filtration efficiency with a MERV 8. I can share a video uh, with one of America's number one building scientists, CR Hero. CR Hero is the chief innovation officer and chief scientific officer at Meritage Homes. CR was a big uh, non-believer. And uh, what we did is, is we worked with CR and we went into his home and uh, he was using a MERV 13. That was Meritage's standard staple with everything they did. And he had a standing particle count at about 500,000 particles per cubic foot of air with the MERV 13 with his fan running at all times. We put the Super V in, we just took the MERV 13 out. We built a transition. We put the Super V in, no nominal pressure loss. Um, and his particle count in the space standing PM 2.5 went to zero in 30 minutes. And we have a great video of him showing that and sharing that. Again, these are real solutions, right? Um, you'll see that the box, Terry, is a little bit bigger. Um, it's bigger because it's a deep V-bank filter. That deep, deep V-bank filter is going to give you a much greater filter life. Um, our traditional Super V systems, whether it's a 1700 or 3400 or 5100, all that means is it's a difference in size. And what that'll give you the ability to do is... Um, you only have to replace these filters once every three years at a 50% loading capacity. So if you're running your HVAC system 100% of the time, it's a year and a half. If you're running the system 50% of the time, it could be up to three years. Very, very effective. And we actually do, and we can send you videos pre and post testing. And a lot of the homes we do, our team of experts will go out, they'll measure pre, they'll measure post. They'll also measure pre and post testing of the actual efficiency of the system. So at the point of entry and at the point of uh, exhaust. Great. Um, Chris had a question of whether you would be able to uh, share screen. I'm not 100 percent sure if we're set up for you to be able to do that today. So I, I don't think I don't think at this point we can. Uh, but that's something we can look at going in the future. Uh, Susan will be, has been putting links up in the chat. So I'll, links to some of the sites Vinny's talked about are there. Um, we'll also have uh, post show. Again, we post uh, later today. The show will be up on HealthyIndoors.com on the HI Show tab. So any of you watching this that are not in the live audience, um, we'll have the links and and all of that extra uh, supplemental information post 
post it along with the recording of the show. Uh, next up, we got Lawrence has a question. So Lawrence, I uh, will give you the floor. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, my, my question is, is, I'm sorry, but it's not commercial. It's much more about an individual uh, looking at purchasing another home, you know, for my family. And what I've seen is a, a lot of homes that have microwave ovens over their cooktop. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, how on earth is that air being filtered or is that good for the home? And you see so many of them. I mean, I'm talking ranging from 500 to a million dollar homes and this great kitchen, blah, blah, blah. Here's a microwave oven sitting on the <laughs> cooktop. I'm not an expert. I'm listening to what you guys are saying. Doesn't seem like that's a good ventilation. So I'm just asking yeah. the experts on that. Well, um, I, I am not an expert on microwaves, but what I can share with you is that in a lot of homes that you'll see now is they have hoods and those hoods are ventilated outdoors. So they are ventilating that air up and out. Um, I don't think with your traditional microwave that's happening. I think they're bringing them up through a generally a, a metal filter and that metal filter is filtering or doing some level of, and that's why you have to change it all the time. Right. Your, your, your exhaust hood for, you know, bigger kitchens and big gas, um, gas stoves, it, they are, mine is ventilating it out of the house. Um, Bob, you may have a better answer there. Yeah, I mean, many of the, you know, j just to, to your question, Lawrence, many of the uh, the traditional over the over the range, you know, mini hood microwave combos are just recyc recirculation units. And a lot a lot of the over range hoods that, you know, that you've seen in place over the years are they're recycling. So all they are is like Vinny mentioned, they're just a fan with a, um, you know, just a metal screen. I mean, it's not much of a filter at all. They really just blow air around. They don't do anything. Um, if, if they do ex exhaust outdoors, they offer some range of it. But interestingly enough, Lawrence Berkeley Labs did a study on this several years back showing the, the capture efficiency of most consumer type uh, range hoods, and most of them are dismal. Unless that hood covers the entire cooking surface and is fairly close to the surface, they pretty much don't do very much. Even, even the ones that do exhaust outside there. I mean, they're, it's an improvement, but they're not nearly as good as you think they are. So that's. Yeah, I mean, it, it, certainly something that exhausts out. I would, it, at the very least, have have something that exhausts outdoors because you're going to pick up some benefit there. But again, it has to be engineered to really do good capture. Um, next up, we've got uh, Les has been waiting in queue for a question. So Les, um, turn yeah, it over to you. you. Uh, so my question is about multifamily. We're, we're developers and builders of multifamily buildings. Um, and we work within LEED and passive house standards. And so we're all about compartmentalizing the units and, and creating a tight air barrier. Um, but how would you, what is your suggestion or what strategies where we've decentralized everything, we've unitized everything uh, through VRV, HVAC systems, through unitized ERV as opposed to a central system? Um, what strategies would you recommend? There's a few. Um, I mean, I, th I think that your issue is very common um, and it's actually becoming more popular in the build space because even as people are building long, larger homes or they're, they're compartmentalizing spaces to be more efficient when they're utilizing each individual environment. Um, I would, there's a few things I would recommend. I mean, I know that people don't like hearing this, but multifamily portable units are a great solution. Um, it's not necessarily the best solution that people like to hear about because they can be picked up and taken away. Um, we do have um, integrated solutions that can be ducted so they can be hung, they can be vented out through a different, uh, with its own self-contained propeller. That would be similar to what uh, the one gentleman mentioned about a, um, a bypass system. It would not be utilizing um, the HVAC system for that, but you could duct it out. Similar to like an FFU. I don't know if you're familiar with an FFU, but they're self-contained units that could be mounted in the space and ducted it would be a separate air cleaning system to be ducted to the spaces that you needed it. Um, you, I, I know that the market is really, really focused on delivering, um, you know, ERVs and VRVs that are much more efficient from a particulate standpoint. I think you're going to see that coming very soon. I think one of the things that this has done is really pushed manufacturers of all HVAC equipment to really focus on how to improve their products. And I think you're going to start seeing that across the board. Um, that's probably what I would recommend at the outset. Uh, but what I'll do is, as I have Kaylin here, I'll also have her address 
this with my engineering team and see if, because we're working with a lot of multifamily projects and see um, if, what they're coming up against and how we could potentially provide some better insight. If we don't have a solution for that, we'd be happy to direct you to someone that would. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Robert Walter, you're next up. I have to unmute yourself. Mute. Yes, I do. There you go. <laughs> Catching these Zoom calls. Okay, very good. Thanks. Uh, Vinny, appreciate it, Bob. Thanks for your uh, your intro and everything. So uh, I really appreciated your uh, your commentary about uh, IDing the contaminants first, because I think in any of those uh, research kind of uh, situations, you need to identify the, the customer's concern. Um, and then also the demands, the other demands of their systems. Uh, you mentioned noise control and, and all of that. So and coming from the asbestos industry, the DOP testing, oh my gosh, uh, people are so lax in that and they, they throw, throw an, an AFD in there and they, they call it a, a game day. Uh, but at any rate, uh, one of the things that was tried, I think, ages ago, I've probably seen it maybe 20 years ago, I didn't know if you had any more current information about filtration, where you've actually tried to cross-link uh, some microbial uh, disinfectants on the filter itself. Without, again, you know, I appreciate your talks about MERV, uh, up to MERV 16, which is really exciting. So yeah, just about I, the I, linking, just about the linking, thanks. Yeah, I think that um, it depends on the coding, right? Anytime you're prevent putting in additives, um, you have to be careful with what you're putting in. Um, you know, this, this stuff really, I, I tell people all the time and the people that have been at it a long time, Bob, and again, lots of other people, it's not rocket science, right? Um, you have a certain amount of suspended pollution and it's about removing, pushing enough air and having a high efficiency collector remove it. There are some additives that we've found are effective. Um, the challenge is for how long? Because mm -hmm. uh, once right. they get coded, you could lose the efficacy. Um, I, I do think uh, the way we handle it through EEF, DEFS is probably a much more effective way because we have a continuous way of um, treating that filter with uh, a known, a known um, microbiostasis effect. I think UV would be another way of approaching it where you have a well-designed mechanical filter with UV that is truly disinfecting the filter. And I think what happens with that is, is you have to make sure that you have a high efficiency collector in the first place, because again, it's all about intensity and contact time. And if you don't have both of those squarely connected, you're, you're, you're just making claims that aren't gonna be able to be delivered upon, right? right? And so that goes back to like everything with our technology is we're capturing everything at the highest efficiency and then permeating the fiber of the media with a continual dosage. And that's the same thing that happens with uh, UV. One of the problems I see with UV uh, or limitations is that, again, it's the penetration, right? In a deep pleated filter. I, 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 I would just always question, you know, UV is, UVC is very effective, right? It's the germicidal UV works if you can radiate a surface. <laughs> You know, yeah. if you get contact yeah. time, it works. But like in a deep filter or let's say a, a, a multi-pass uh, cooling coil, really? On the other side I of always, it? I always get concerned about what I say on a webinar or on a podcast because I don't need industries chasing me down because there's a lot of money at stake right now. No, I can all, say that. All, all, all I, yeah, all, <laughs> you can. All I have to say is that UV um, implemented properly uh, is effective. What that means, I'll leave it up. I'll, that's that's in the eye of the implementer. And, and um, that's really that's really it right there, though, Vinny. You hit, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think UV is a very effective technology. And, and you know, it, with anything, though, any technology has its limitations. You have to understand the limitations of the technologies you're utilizing. That's, 100%. You know. 110%. I couldn't agree more. So we have another question here. Um, let's see. No, we actually didn't have another. Uh, Susan, do we have another one coming up in, in queue? I guess I just scrolled off past it um, um yes patrick patrick all right, we'll give you the floor got to unmute first right you, yeah that um, helps. <laughs> yeah so we had a company come through here and start a lot of these or install a lot of these um i believe they're electrostatic only filtration systems the they, they look similar to what you have on your website for the whole house system that that box thing okay and then 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 they came through and replaced most of them with a filter that was specifically designed, I believe by 3M or somebody to fit that box because they didn't work. Um, we have an incredible amount of silica here where we're surrounded by glaciers. And yep. an example would be, an example would be in the air quality industry, I'm a member of a network nationwide and in Canada, and there's a couple hundred of us 
most of them air sample five to seven, sometimes 10 minutes, like in Phoenix, even in Phoenix and Florida. I can't sample over three, maybe four minutes. And I plug my, fil my canisters with uh, silica. Yeah. So has your system been utilizing that kind of an environment? Oh, so it's a great question. So when you're talking about electrostatic precipitation, it's much, much different. Um, the biggest challenge you have with electrostatic precipitation generally is they're very, very efficient at first. But when that plate loads up, what happens? Yep. Uh, so you Got see it. A, a, a dramatic shift. I mean, probably the biggest success story of electrostatic precipitation would be the, uh, the uh, sharp image ionic breeze way back in the day. And, but they didn't have a fan. Uh, so they did it all wrong. But generally, electrostatic precipitation is very effective. The challenge is you have to maintain it and clean it all the time, which every month in, in, your, in your situation, you'd have to clean it every, probably every two weeks. And so where the big HEPA okay. or where the big mechanical filtration movement came in was after that, where people said, wait a minute, we're not going to maintain these things. People aren't going to spend their time cleaning it. So they went with a standard mechanical filter, a high efficiency filter to address the drawbacks of having to maintain it all the time. Our system's completely different. We're using a, a mechanical filter that's a deep pleated V-bank filter that's 100% sealed. It's a high efficiency filter that's a synthetic media and we're charging that media so it never loses efficiency. So we're not, we're not collecting on grids. We're not collecting on, um, from an electrostatic standpoint on plates and having to clean it. We're collecting through a high efficiency media. Interesting. Okay. And uh, so, for example, to give you a perfect example, we, we, we install products in over 17 countries. A lot of people talk about humidity and how humidity impacts things and how it can glob up things. Uh, we're very, very, we're, we're in all a Sheikh Khalif Medical City, which is the Cleveland Clinic operated in Abu Dhabi, the largest hospital system. Uh, we work in all environments. Um, you know, we, we would always invite people into our facility to check out what we're doing here, but we test exactly what you're talking about. Um, we do massive concentrations of particles and pollutants and VOCs into the environment, and we test those units over time. Why? For us, the biggest issue we could have is have a thousand machines in the market that aren't working. Um, so we want to make sure before we send something out to the field that it works in all conditions or not sell in that environment. Yeah, our, our paper filters locally get enough of uh, that fine silica in them that when we get into our humid months, you know, spring and fall, yep. we have really humid months during snow melt, which hopefully happens soon. Um, <laughs> they, it you actually, still have snow? It's snowing like crazy right now. It oh, actually muddies located? up our, what's that? Where are you located? Uh, just outside of Anchorage, Alaska. In oh my goodness! Um, I, mean, I thought the only place that got snow in uh, April was Pulaski, New York, Bob. Well, or Sy Syracuse. I mean, you, you get a little more than us, but he, he's just really just up the street from us, effectively. Yeah, up the yeah. street. What thirty miles? Yeah, forty it muddies miles. up those. It turns those those paper filters to mud um, yeah. from the humidity in the air. That's how fine yeah. that silica is. Well, you know, I, I I can't speak specifically to your your actual environment. But you know, what one of the things we could do is, is we'd be happy to send your machine down at, at, at basically cost for you to try it out and give it a, give it a shot. It could be a great use case. Good idea. I mean, yeah. I, and I'll try, I'll chime in a little bit on, on electrostatic precipitator because I've seen those over the years as an IAQ guy, you know, been seeing those since the nineties, actually since the mid eighties. And yeah, that's the whole thing. It's like, you know, in the residential ones and I, we won't name the name either, you know, the name shall remain unnamed and the four inch pleated filters they get stuck in and in placement. You know, I, I know exactly what you're referring to. And the thing is those things were, were fairly effective. Like Vinny stated, if you clean the plates regularly, as soon as the plates get, you know, dirty, they start discharging, you start losing particles and stuff goes right past them. So, you know, I, I would always tell homeowners that even back in the day in the nineties, if you want to buy one of these things, you better be cleaning that thing every week or every two or three weeks. I mean, it's just, and then it, it actually will perform quite well, but um, we have another question where probably the last one we're going to get to today. Vinny, you have a follow-up on that? Oh, go ahead. No. Okay. Uh, Peter, Peter's uh, still on. You can unmute yourself and we'll let you ask your question. Oh, you're still muted. There we go. So can you hear me now? Yeah, we've got you now. Thanks, Bob. Uh, listen uh, to you and to Vinny. How would you suggest dealing with a residential situation where the ERV seems to be distributing allergens in the defrost mode, where the air is re being recirculated from the house to the house through the same core surface that normally is taking air from the outside? So there is some contamination that is getting recirculated through the house. And I'm not sure if it's coming from the outside or from somewhere inside. 
but mm -hmm. but it is one of those ERVs that you know redirect airflow in the defrost mode, which I've decided I do not like. Bob, do you want to take that one? I'll take a shot at it, and and let me let me precursor this by saying I I'm not necessarily the end all expert in this but there are there's a couple of possibilities could be going on there one could be that you could have an issue with uh a failure in the core you know first and foremost you know I, first thing i would say is you know is that core is that core st still have its integrity the gaskets everything's still in place and i'm assuming you're talking about a residential erv it's probably a paper core unit but I, i'm not sure um versus some sort of a, a desiccant wheel you know, you're not uh, uh, it's different technologies it it's a core, yes. It's a core, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the first first and foremost is, you know, you could have some sort of breaching uh, through the core is what I'm, what I'm thinking, you know, and or, and or bringing, Vinny mentioned this earlier, bringing outside air, you know, that's that's contaminated and that's that's coming through the system because again, that's, that's the air that's making it indoors. Uh, so maybe mm -hmm. it's not properly filtering what's coming in from the outside stream. I've seen that the surface of the core was uh, peppered with some uh, mold. Ah, okay. So, so you I actually have visible mold growth on the core. Yeah, at so that I, point. But it, I replaced it, that core, Okay. a new core, but I'm still feeling those symptoms when it goes into the frost. Yeah, it sounds like potentially um, you're, you're getting contamination on that surface. So you're dra either dragging, you're dragging a lot of uh, contaminants either from the outdoor air and, and, impacting them on one side of the, you know, on the outside air stream of the core, or somehow on your exhaust side, you're pulling a bunch of stuff out that's impacting there. And since that core is getting wet in the, you know, in, in that mode, it's, it's allowing to grow there. But um, we can talk about that a, a, after the fact that it's a, that's a real specific granular issue that you're running into there. Um, at, at this point, we're getting to, toward our wrap up point. So Vinny, I would like to uh, direct something over to you. Um, how, how do you, where do you see this industry, you know, going from the air purification, air cleaning industry going forward? I mean, you've been in, you've been in, in this game for a while, so you, you've got an, a, a longer perspective than many people. Um, how, post COVID, I guess I'm, I'm talking post pandemic, you know, or, do, do yeah, you see big changes ahead? Yeah. I mean, I, I think again, a fundamental shift in the industry as a whole has happened. I don't think we'll, our new normal will certainly have IAQ as a focal point. I'm speaking with some of the top executives in America at, at blue chip companies, fortune 500 companies, um, looking at the industry forecasts and how they're getting people back. There has been a fundamental shift in where air quality sits on the priority list. It used to be where you'd go into, you know, a Google or an Apple and they want to talk about, you know, changing the beautiful rooms for their parents, kids and, you know, crazy stuff. Um, now it's all about how do we address IAQ? It's really um, top of mind. Um, I think because of the prolonged nature of this pandemic, that uh, for the next 10 years, you're going to just see a, a really high priority focus on both new builds, on existing infrastructure and on uh, how we live in those spaces. Because listen, it's not just about purification or filtration. It's about all the other things that we do that impact the built environment. I mean, every single building with a door needs improvement. I mean, we, we live in very unhealthy spaces. It's not just air quality, it's a lot of things. And so I think this is a great time for the industry. I think as a, as a whole, we can rise up and really bring great information to the marketplace to make a, make a significant impact at a time where it's needed most. I know you have uh, some involvement with uh, IBWI, you know, and, and they've been really pushing, you know, the, the well building messaging uh, and seen a lot of, uh, you know, uh, marketing on their part, you know, use, using celebrities. And um, do, do you feel that initiatives like that are, are going to have uh, be impactful? Oh, I mean, I have I have been a fan of uh, IWBI uh, and what they focused on for years, as I mentioned to you previously. I mean, I think, again, um, anytime you can bring that type of awareness to this very, very particular issue, it's going to be great for everyone involved. I mean, listen, when you have JLo and Michael B. Jordan and Lady Gaga out there telling you to look about, you know, your healthy buildings matter. It's going to resonate with some people that it wouldn't have if it were me and you, Bob. Uh, right. If we're out there telling people, they don't really care. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really I, I'm really impressed with how they've been able to get out there and push that narrative. 
and do it in a responsible way. I mean, looking at what lead did and then looking at maybe where lead had fell short um, and kind of bringing, merging the health sciences and the building sciences together, I think it's going to be great for everyone involved. And, and we're, we're big advocates and supporters of the whole movement. Excellent. Um, we're, we're running out of time. You know, it's, and it always seems like we run out of time uh, right, right when we start to really get the discussion up and rolling. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to uh, actually show a couple of Vinny's uh, sites right now, uh, just to the Healthway site. And I'm not sure if I'm, we're showing the right ones, but these ones we have queued. Um, and it's healthway.com, um, the IntelliPure site. And also, ooh, this is what happens when you're doing your own engineering. <laughs> so, so uh, we'll ha we'll have uh, links to all of this stuff available in the uh, in the post show uh, where we ha we'll have uh, up on healthyindoors.com. If you go to the uh, HI show link uh, later on today, we'll have the recording from this episode as well as uh, some extra extra links and things that were mentioned in the episode. And uh, you'll also be able to access the audio podcast around that same time. So we'll have th those up and up and uh, ready to go. Um, this is a great show, Vinny. This is great having you on the show. It's uh, hey, it's I, I wish we had two hours. <laughs> it's a, again, it's an exciting time, and I think that uh, for all of us, there's so much more we can do to make a positive impact. And Bob, you've been someone not uh, not blowing smoke up you, but this you've been someone that's really been adamant for years about getting this right. And it's it's what's what I'm really happy about is that uh, you're now getting your time to really push this message out because you do a great job. So we're grateful to be a small part of it. Well, I, I certainly appreciate the accolades there. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's a host of, you know, or I should say a combination of more than just me too. Um, you know, hats off again to um, our editor and moderator for the show here, Susan Valenti. Um, she is instrumental in a lot of the things we're doing and she's she's been uh, in the industry forever. Not, don't, don't take that as a slight because you're still younger than me. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've been doing this for a while and uh, yeah, we, we're, it's, a, it's a passion project for us too, Vinny. I'll, I'll tell you, we we're not just doing this as a job. We do this because we believe in what we do here. So we're, we're really happy to be part of it. Um, so I guess now it's, it's time to once again, bid adieu. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're past our mark. So we'll be back next week. We have uh, almost a, a great, a great follow-up show to this show. Um, Bud Offerman, uh, Glenn Morrison, and uh, Tom Licker uh, will all be on. We're going to be talking uh, really about Bud Offerman uh, published a white paper uh, a little while back uh, talking about snake oil in the IAQ industry and snake oil solutions. And he, he was he was a little critical on some things. Um, so we're going to have him on. Glenn Morrison was talking about that same uh, issue. Uh, he's another IAQ industry uh, person that's been around for a long time. He was talking about that back as, uh, in 2018. And uh, Tom, Tom is interesting because he'll be coming as a perspective of uh, somebody who's uh, a contractor in the space. Um, so this will this will be a great show. So it'll be the uh, IAQ Snake Oil Show. No, that's that's really not what the title is, but we'll come up with a more of a working <laughs> title. <laughs> you know, it, and it should. I, I think we'll have some uh, some uh, interesting discussions there. So in the meantime. Um, Check out healthyindoors.com. That, that's our that's our home portal. Um, you can get all the episodes of the show, uh, all the back issues of Healthy Indoors magazine. There's eight years plus there, and you can also learn more about our new online community portal. It's uh, the Healthy Indoors uh, Global Online Community, uh, which will be debuting shortly. We're in final beta stages with that, and you can learn more about that uh, by clicking on the link that says uh healthy indoors community so uh until next time uh we'll see you next week again thursday uh that's uh yeah, it's, you'll remember this day, April 15th, right? That rings in some people's minds. Uh, Thursday, April 15th from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, Eastern time. So uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, I'm Bob Krell. Uh, please stay uh, healthy and safe. Thanks, Bob.